everyone. Welcome back for our third session of the ACT Network Breakout that's focusing on the new Shrine web client. So I will pass things off to Anna Palma to kick us off. Thanks, Elena. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Anupama Maram. I uh, work at Harvard Catalyst as a senior business analyst for the Shrine team. And today I'll be running the demo and on behalf of the team, um, which includes Griffin Weber, our uh, Shrine uh, senior leadership, Doug McFadden, Dan Kyo, Bill Simons, and Mark Sariello, and the entire Shrine dev and support teams. Um, so I'm sure everyone on this call has heard of these acronyms before, so I'll just do a very quick review. Uh, successful multi-site clinical trials requires researchers to identify and recruit patient subjects. Um, but oftentimes it's really challenging for researchers to meet their initial recruitment goals. And that's really one of the reasons for the ACT network. Uh, this network is a nationwide federation of CTSA, that's Clinical and tra Translational Science Awarded Institutions. Um, and they agree to uh, share aggregate patient counts from their electronic health record data. So in order to be part of the ACT network, each site has to first install I2B2, which is an open source application that connects to the EHR data repositories. Um, the I2B2 query and analysis tool allows researchers to query and obtain patient counts at their own institution. These uh, local I2B2 instances are then linked by the Shrine platform, which stands for the Shared Health Research Information Network. Um, it includes a web-based federated query tool that allows these researchers to construct those same exact queries that they did in their I2B2 instance. But this time when they run it in the Shrine platform, they can obtain real-time aggregate counts across all of the network sites. So because of the national scope of the ACT network, researchers have access to patient set with uh, regional diversity. Um, and it really helps with clinical trial cohort discovery and determining study feas feasibility. Um, it, really uh, solves these two key questions. Where do I find these patients and how many patients meet my study's eligibility criteria? To date, the network connects over 60 CTSA sites uh, across the different tiers and it contains data of more than 125 million patients. So why are we doing this? So the existing Shrine interface that is on the ACT production network um, was derived from and closely resembles I2B2 code that is around 12 years old at this point. Um, and there are some key differences between the features in I2B2 and Shrine. Um, they do not have a one-to-one -one match. Um, and of course, the key difference being that Shrine displays patient counts from multiple network sites. The ACT network, as you've seen, is growing, and in order to better serve the needs of this expanding research audience, um, we've made some um, underlying assumptions about this ideal researcher. It's not exactly a design persona, but you know, used in a similar spirit um, that aided in our decision process. So our assumptions about these novice users um, were that they may be unfamiliar with I2B2 or EHR data. Um, in response to that, we wanted to make sure we had a more intuitive, user-friendly interface that incorporated um, modern standards of design, usability, look and feel, and accessibility. Um, we wanted to make sure we were selecting functionality that was the most valuable to novice users while still continuing to support the use case of co patient cohort discovery and determining study feasibility. Um, and like all projects, we also had a timeline constraint, which in our case was about a year. So what we've done so far, we're just uh, about wrapping up our first release. Um, this not only includes activities in the development phase, but also a product discovery phase. The focus of this part was on researching and defining the scope of the project, establishing business goals, understanding what a successful outcome would be, carrying out user research, and understanding the current market. Um, the key activities included an 
internal needs analysis. So uh, we just, oh, I'll go into that detail on the next slide. Uh, we then did an external landscape analysis of existing tools in the same space. So checking out what, uh, checking out the competition, what other tools researchers were using. Um, both of these uh, provided us with enough information that we're able to rapidly and frequently iterate on the design concepts and wireframes. Um, we also held uh, different focus groups uh, where we wanted to make sure that the new interface was collaborative and really resonated with the research community. Um, and at this point, we're pretty close to um, a final release candidate. There's still a bit of work, uh, but we're almost there. Um, so our needs analysis. So this step focused on a few things. Uh, we combed through our backlog to make sure we understood the strengths and the opportunities for the application. Um, we reached out and talked to a few user reps. Um, so these are I2B2 trainers at other institutions. So they're not exactly our novice users. Uh, we would say they're more expert users, but it, we knew that they would provide us with a broader understanding of how they structure the training of their own end users and help us understand how researchers grasp onto the concepts. We also looked at um, ct.gov. This is clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so it's a registry of clinical trials that's run by the National Library of Medicine at the NIH. It's one of the largest clinical trials database. Um, and what we did was we parsed through about a couple dozen eligibility criteria to understand how um, it was communicated and we used that to help validate the decisions we were making and also to figure out what type of language and terminology we should be using in the application. So all of this helped us sort of create out the feature list that we thought would be the most valuable to uh, what we define as those novice users. Uh, the next step involved us looking at a landscape analysis of existing tools. Uh, for, well, I looked at four different tools, three of which are open source um, informatics tool that all provide some uh, similar functionality, but um, their interfaces have different design philosophies and different goals. And each of them all took a different approach in their final design, which was based on the expertise of their target audience and also to possibly highlight special characteristics of their underlying data. The first UI you looked at, which you'll see here, um, the screenshot is the picture UI, which is used at Boston Children's Hospital and was developed by Paul Aviak's group. This UI has a very minimalist approach. It's almost referred, uh, to, almost has like a Google-like search and look and feel to it. Um, it's very straightforward in terms of its query construction. As you can see, it builds the query from the top down. Um, and in this picture, it's really clear that each panel is joined by the AND logical operator. The next tool we looked at um, was uh, developed by LEAF, um, which is the based out of the University of Washington Institute of Translational Medicine. LEAF was inspired by I2B2. You can perhaps get a sense of that from the layout here with the three panels on the right. Um, some of the key innovations for LEAF was that it displays queries as sort of readable sentences. So it uh, really avoids a lot of the technical um, jargon. So instead of just displaying the concept, which is type 2 diabetes, the UI would display um, patients who had a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. And this really just helps reinforce the user, understand how they are defining their own uh, patient population. The next UI was uh, made by a group called Growing Bear. Um, so this was created for Transmart, um, an application that's based on the I2B2 data model, but geared more towards translational research studies. Again, they also have a similar top-down approach to building their queries. Um, it also includes various analysis and data export tools that are just not used in I2B2 or Shrine at the moment. Um, and the last tool we looked at was Trinetics. Um, I don't have a screenshot of Trinetics, but it is an enterprise tool that's gaining a lot of attention for its ease of use. And it is starting to become widely adopted at the different CTSAs. Um, we felt it was really important for us to really understand the ecosystem at each of these sites 
um, and understand the different applications that researchers were being used, asked to use. So I just went through a few existing UIs. So it kind of begs the question, why, why didn't we just use one that was already out there? Why are we adding yet another UI to the mix? Um, well, at the time that we started this project, LEAF was not open source. Um, Trinetics, obviously, it's an enterprise tool. Um, moreover, our team has a lot of experience over a decade of being able to create scalable asynchronous tools um, that support uh, the ability to support dozens of sites. Um, making sure that we're, we're relaying uh, the query status, the results, handling demographic information. We've also set up processes to address privacy and security. Um, so that's through the data steward application, um, obfuscating the count and being able to perform audit history at, at the network level. Um, we also made a strategic decision that in order to achieve the goal of creating this new UI for novice user in the one year grant cycle, it made a lot of sense to just keep our existing backend infrastructure and then build a new UI on top of it. So you might recognize this screenshot. Um, this is the Shrine UI that is currently on ACT production. Um, so like I mentioned, we are focusing on novice users and by design, we've decided to focus on only uh, recreating those essential features for novice users. Um, so not all of the features that are currently available in the production ver version will be available in the new UI. Um, and as a result, when we release, we will be supporting two web clients. Um, the existing legacy web client, which will be geared more towards those advanced users, um, for example, who may need to use temporal or event-based queries. Um, and then we'll have the, the new UI, which is more geared towards novice users. Um, so while we will be supporting two web clients, this will not require another Shrine install. Um, they will be sharing the same backend infrastructure and there will be a degree of cross compatibility between the two web clients. Another one of our design goals was to um, improve the search of the ACT ontology. The ontology itself has over 2 million concepts. Um, and so we really wanted to make sure that uh, users didn't feel overwhelmed. We knew that they would appreciate the completeness of the ontology, but we wanted to make sure we were able to help them to quickly locate the terms that they needed. Um, and finally, we wanted to avoid a lot of technical jargon. We wanted to make sure the UI didn't contain terminology like ontology, queries, Boolean logic. So we wanted to rephrase the language so it became a little more approachable. We also wanted to make sure there's a clear progression of the workflow and the steps that was required of the user. Um, so all of this information from this discovery phase, uh, we iterated on the design, we were inspired by and borrowed ideas from these other interfaces I just showed you, um, and we listened to the community and we finally came up with two unique concepts. Um, we tested out those concepts to make sure it was received by the community. We got feedback to verify we were building the right tool and solving the right problem. Just this morning at the I2B2 UI working group session, I just recapped how um, the community engagement process helped us make decisions at pivot points during our development process. And like Doug mentioned at the conference last year, we did hold these focus group session. So these were small teams where we presented the two uh, concepts. We selected a study from clinicaltrials.gov and we had each team of users like walk through step by step the interface. Um, and it was a really great exercise and we're able to narrow down to the decision, which you'll see a bit in the demo. Um, we've also been, um, like I mentioned, um, going back to the I2B2 UI working group um, very frequently. And it really helps us when we you know, can't agree on a design or trying to figure out what the correct layout is and has been a really great re resource for us to listen to and take direction from. And finally, we're also conducting um, sessions with novice users. These are one-to-one -one sessions um, about 45 minutes to an hour long where we're 
we ask the user to interact with the new web client and we're sort of recording their observations and so I'm um, talking through what their um, end to end workflow might be like. Um, we are continuing to hold these sessions and Mark will provide more details at the end if you're interested um, and would like to get involved. So right before I um, demo, I just wanted to point out um, a lot of we discovered that while you know we can create this new UI it, 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 that addresses issues of usability, there were still other challenges. Um, so we are making it easier for novice users to build a query, but not necessarily helping or offering additional help to translate their study criteria into the best query. Um, so some of these challenges might be related to data characterization, data quality, um, and data completeness. You know, each site has to upload their data. Um, there might be differences in coding practices at the site, the difference in how the billing staff will interpret the medical notes and translate those into codes. There's, you know, as mentioned, differences in patient populations. Um, and also the question of, you know, I found these counts, so what is my next immediate step? Um, we have been looking at taking steps to address these concerns and I'll point out in the, how we've been able to leverage the UI um, to address that last point to sort of help researchers figure out their next step after uh, getting patient counts. All right, so for the demo. Um, so this is our new login page. Um, you'll notice that right here we are, our strategy is to uh, redirect traffic to the new UI. So we've placed a link right here um, so we can easily navigate users to the legacy web client. Like I mentioned, we do expect a level of cross compatibility between the legacy web client and the new UI. I mean, what exactly do I mean by that is that the queries that were created in the legacy web client will be viewable in the new UI and vice versa. So I'm just going to go ahead and log in. Um, and right before I do that, I will point out that this demo node was created on the act production tier. So you will be seeing production level data today. One of the first things we wanted to do, since this is a very different UI, that, um, that we wanted to create a product tutorial so we can orient the user to the new layout. Um, so this will, simple tutorial will just walk them through the different panels. So one of the first things you'll notice here is that we've uh, labeled this panel the medical concept list. So like I mentioned, we did not want to use the term ontology. You'll also notice that we combined the search, the existing search and browse into one view. Um, and we've also created these new root folders. So we wanted a way to organize the different medical um, domains to make the browse um, a little more approachable. So the next we have um, the to we advise the user to go and define their inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, I'll point out that this terminology was inspired from some of the work we did um, from analyzing the studies from clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so like I mentioned, we don't want to use the word query anywhere in the application. And then you'll also notice we're displaying queries um, as readable sentences. So it's combining that and and or logic and really avoiding a lot of the technical jargon. Um, the next step is um, allow, uh, having the user be able to easily discover how to specify date ranges or occurrences. And then finally, selecting topics, specifying a name, and running the query. Um, and at the end here, we do have a link to a feedback survey. So the survey will be managed by the Data Harmonization Committee. Um, and it'd be a really great way for us to get um, quick feedback on um, user success with the application and just sort of what they liked and didn't like. So we have some data for um, future features. Um, so I'm going to notice, um, po also point out above here. So we do have three separate tabs. Um, we made a decision to create, uh, you know, to divide up the existing one page application into uh, two separate uh, web pages. I'll talk about this towards the end. 
Um, so the goal here was to make sure we were focusing the user on that specific activity um, to make it a little more approachable. So on this find patient tab, your goal is really to build out your uh, research criteria. I mean, so like I mentioned, one of the things we'll have to do is like make it easy for make it easier for users to locate their terms. And so we did streamline the search and browse, and we've removed all those additional fields um, just to make it really easy to find your terms. So you can go ahead and browse here, locate all of your terms and just drag it over to the box. You'll notice that additional panels appear below as they're filled out. So you're only seeing um, the information that you need. The other piece I'll point out here are, is the uh, displaying the code category. So as you drag concepts over, we wanted to reinforce where um, the code category was, and it also helps um, construct the phrase. So find patients with a demographic of zero to nine years. So up here, I'll show how we go about the search. Um, so as you begin typing, we do have an auto suggest that auto, um, appears below. Um, this auto suggest is based off of um, all of the uh, whole words that are in the ACT ontology and they're ranked by the frequency of occurrence. So if I select influenza virus, it's telling me that there's roughly 3,000 concepts in the entire ACT ontology, um, ACT ontology that contain the phrase influenza virus. And so this we felt was a really great first step and um, perhaps in the future we will add and augment to, to make this a smarter search. So once I go ahead and execute my search, it's displaying all of the matching, uh, co the concepts that match my input criteria. Um, so we do display all uh, 3,000 uh, 3, concepts. So the user just has to scroll for them to sort of have that sort of seamless user experience. If I know, for example, I'm specifically looking for ICD-10 concepts, you can go ahead up here um, select the domain that you're interested in, and then it will filter the search results to just display the IC10 codes that contain um, influenza virus. So I can go here and continue to drag and drop. Um, and to create an exclusion panel, it's really simple. You just go ahead and toggle it, and you'll notice that there's um, a, both a color change and the change of, of the word to without. You'll notice we also have embedded help text throughout the um, entire uh, workflow. So we tell them you can add additional concepts into these groups or drag a concept here for the next inclusion or exclusion criteria. And down below, we do have the date range. So it's really easy to just um, select the date range that you're looking for. And you'll notice that the information here dynamically changes. So it's, um, it's readable and it's making sure that your changes have been uh, saved. Um, the last piece I want to show is specifically for a laboratory test. So when I grab over one of these nodes, um, you'll notice how easy it is for a user to be able to specify flag values or specify specific values. So it's all just really intuitive and very straightforward for how a user might go about selecting that information. Um, if I wanna go back here and look at um, where this concept came from, I could click on this and it will show me the relative path to that specific concept. And it will also list all of the um, folders that are nested inside of the selected concept. Um, another feature here, um, which we heard about from the last I2B2 conference, and we were able to respond to it, is the ability for users to create their topics within the application. So I can go ahead and create a topic here. Um, and we also have built in validations across the way to make sure you're entering your data the right way. Um, if I create this topic, it will automatically appear um, within the web client without having to force me to navigate to, enough to the data stored application. So again, we're just streamlining that process. So say for example here, I'm done with uh, selecting my criteria. 
I can go ahead and enter a name here, or I can auto-generate a name just for ease of use. And you'll notice that now I'm able to go ahead and obtain patient counts. And that will redirect me to a, um, another tab altogether. So you'll notice here as I'm waiting for the results to come in, I'll draw your attention to um, this text that's appearing here. So as the results are coming back, you get it rolls up to the number of sites that were able to provide a patient count. And it also adds up uh, to the maximum uh, patient count that you can find. So that's a really cool thing we were able to do. Um, we also have some help text here because of the obfuscation, we wanted to make sure uh, researchers understood what that boundary meant. Um, so a few other uh, things to note here. You'll notice that the table um, has alternating um, row colors to just make it easy to parse through the information. We also have the ability to sort. And so um, these icons are really helpful in letting you know it's sorting by the lowest number first. So you'll see all the 10 patients are fewer. Or you can reverse sort. Well, I believe this specific one. Let me see if I can find another one that had, there we go. So I can sort by lowest number or sort by highest number first. All of the statuses or error messages are always filtered to the bottom. And likewise, I can sort by site name. Um, up here, you'll notice that um, this result, the first query I just ran, is now bold. And that's indicating to me that I have new results that I can go look at. Um, so I can go ahead and be able to find that information. A few other things that we did is um, this query definition. So we had wanted to make sure we had it in a readable format that everyone could understand. Um, it's really easy to be able to copy paste the, copy this and paste it into um, a separate documentation. We also have um, if you do copy paste the table, we do uh, preserve that table format. So we have some help text just to make sure you're copying and pasting it into a CSV or a text file the right way in order to make sure you preserve that uh, table format. Um, a lot of the information here, so in this previous results panel, has was redesigned in a previous uh, release of Shrine. So we didn't do a lot of um, work here, we just wanted to make sure we were translating those features. So we do have the ability to flag a query for follow up and the ability to edit the query name. And again, I know I'm saying query, but we've purposely renamed it. Um, uh, we purposely use terminology such as renaming the criteria set. Um, and now here we just have status indicators that are helpful for a user to understand where um, their work, their query is in the workflow. So some, they're still in progress or there's an error and you might need to rerun it again. Um, once we have counts from all of the sites or a status of site error, it will then change to completed. So all of the ones that are still here are still waiting and hopeful for at least one site to bring back a result. Um, and up here, I think it's sort of hidden, we have this edit criteria button. So this is really great because I can go ahead and click this button and what it will do is it will re take me back to my find patients tab, but it reloads those concepts. So I don't have to go and reconstruct it all over again. And then a few other features up here, we do have this account button. So um, a user can view um, their user information, their, where the domain that they're logging in from. We do have um, help text nested underneath here. So these link out to external documentation and these are all configurable by the site. So you can add additional help resources down here. Um, the next is this next steps link. Um, so this is what I was alluding to in terms of uh, leveraging the UI in order to help researchers uh, navigate their next step. Um, so right now, this uh, is pointing to the ACT National webpage. There is a page that is currently um, under construction. Griffin Weber is working with the ACT Data Harmonization Group to create a step, a, a set of next steps that will sort of guide researchers into understanding um, what their next immediate action should be. 
Okay, so I'll flip back to my slides. Um, so like I mentioned, um, what are our next steps? Um, so we do have some immediate next steps. We are in the middle of preparing um, a release candidate. So there's still some work for us to do to make sure um, we can get that ready. Um, and while that's happening, I'll also be working on continuing to add new features to this new web client. So um, immediately we're going to be focusing on temporal or event-based queries and breakdowns. Um, so if you have any feedback on that, um, Mark will uh, direct you towards how you can share your feedback with us. Um, and there's also, um, you know, Jeff and Michelle mentioned the um, data quality initiative. So part of that is to create a proof of concept of how we can incorporate information about the site's quality and completeness into uh, the UI itself. Um, and then with that, I'll hand it over to you, Mark. Great, thanks very much, Anupama. Um, for folks who don't know my name, um, I'm Mark Sariello. I'm a senior project manager here at Harvard Catalyst. And I work with um, Anupama and the rest of the Shrine development team, as well as the network operations group within the, um, within ACT. So um, I, I guess sort of by historical precedent, I've been the one that has sort of made the plea for uh, new user feedback. So what we have there on the screen is a QR code as well as a link, which I will go ahead and paste into the chat in a moment. Um, or in a if you don't mind doing that, that would be that would be great. Um, and so what I what this is, is just a form that we would ask anyone who's interested in doing a one on one session to fill out. Um, this just it asks for a little bit of information about you, um, your institution, your level of familiarity with ITB2 and Shrine. And all that does once you submit it is gets us um, seeing your name on our roster of individuals that might be willing to participate in a, a session, a one on one session with Anupama. Um, it does not commit you to participating in a session at any time. What we end up doing with that roster is just sending out some um, notifications that we are looking for people at intervals and um, giving you the opportunity to sign up for a slot if the if the uh, you know if your schedule matches up with what we're looking for. Um, so it's not a commitment at any point there. The other thing I would suggest is you know we are looking also for um, end users, especially novice end users. Oh, thanks for that, Inupama, that's in the chat now at the link. Um, is if you have end users who uh, you are credentialing to use ACT um, on production, then it would be, um, you know, absolutely fine if you wanted to provide that link as well. If you get questions from them or if they say, I, you know, I don't really understand why the application works, you know, this way, it's kind of frustrating or uh, they would be a good person for us to speak with. We would be happy to have them get on our roster. Um, so feel free to give out that link as well. The third sort of part of my plea that I will make is uh, we are looking, as Anupama mentioned, to be developing uh, temporal queries, time-based queries, and breakdowns next. So we're also looking for folks especially who are familiar with and who regularly use time-based queries within um, Shrine. So you want to hear a little bit more about how you use them, the detail and the level uh, that you're looking for when you do queries like that. And so we would also be um, really glad to have your input. If you uh, have specifically, you know, a lot of desire and need for temporal queries, um, feel free to send me an email um, or to fill out the form and let us know. There's no spot on the form to say that you are particularly interested in that area, but um, you can also just drop me an email if you'd like. My email address is there if you don't have it already. Um, and with that, I'll also say, you know, we should, I think, open up to Q&A at this point if you're comfortable with that, Anupama. Yep, that's perfect. Okay, so feel free. Oh, thanks, Desiree, just dropped my um, email address in there. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, so feel free to put questions into the Q&A if you have them for Anupama um, about the new web client. As Anupama mentioned, we're in the last stages of testing, and actually I'll be looking for some sites 
um, on a non-production tier that would be willing to install this early and uh, make sure that it works happily in the real world outside of our development environment. Um, so this will be coming out uh, fairly soon. But we'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, we've got, we've got a first question from Daniel Harris here about a ballpark time estimate for the release candidate. Yes, um, taking half a step back, we do, we have a number of testing environments that we leverage here at Harvard Catalyst. Um, you know, we've got a main sort of QA environment as well as some user acceptance testing and demo environments. Um, and we are running the testing through the, uh, our QA environments right now. Um, we, the next step we will take is to have a subset of sites that will be willing to take a pre-release version and put that, install that locally on a non-production um, tier, either stage or test. Um, we will we'll figure out which one is the one we would like to use and just give it kind of a smoke test for us to make sure that there is connectivity and that everything works as expected in the real world. What's different about the real world, I guess, from our testing environments is we don't necessarily, we're not really able to simulate all of the differences there might be in local installation choices, um, like proxies or, you know, firewall setups or having, um, you know, uh, some of the components split onto different servers, some of the infrastructure choices that you may have made or that you may be forced to for uh, your, because of institutional rules, um, we're not able to simulate all of those in our testing environments. So um, I will be looking for volunteers for uh, a pre-release version to help us make sure that it still works happily in the real world. And uh, for a ballpark, I would say in probably the next three weeks, we should be looking at having a release that we would be able to put out and plan for a rollout for it um, on the ACT uh, production network. Um, so that there'll be more information about the sort of start date on that coming up, but it is coming up to be very close. Um, Dan Connolly has a question here looking for a pointer to the source code. Um, I think that Bill Simons provided that in the chat. Um, and we can cut and paste that again. And uh, Mark Abajian says, it looks great. Thank you. Um, and many of the Shrine team are actually on the, on the line right now. So it's um, great to hear the uh, fact that it looks good to you. Um, is there any way to export a query report PDF or CSV of the query results? Um, good question. I think this is something that Anna Palma can touch on. Right, so we don't have a direct export feature at the moment. Um, the compromise for this first release is um, to have this uh, readable format of the query definition. Um, so that's one piece. And the second piece is um, a simple copy paste here. So if you highlight the rows that you're interested in, copy it, you're able to uh, preserve that formatting in an Excel, um, in an Excel file. Uh, we are exploring possibly um, making a more robust export, but that would have to be in a later release. Yeah, this is, I, I'll just opine very quickly. And uh, I, this was really interesting. I think the idea of having a CSV or some sort of export of the results is something that has been uh, discussed. It's sort of an area that we are aware of. And as Annie Palma said, um, if you copy and paste carefully, um, you know, you can actually put it into an Excel spreadsheet quite nicely at this point. Um, but we are really interested in talking with people after we do this first release or even leading up to it about how they use the tool. I think we've had some conversations, um, or at least I've been privy to some of the conversations that have happened with users that in Apama you've done uh, quite a few of. And we, I think I was sort of surprised by how people were using the tool or wanting to use the tool. Um, you know, differently than maybe we had expected. Um, I don't know if you think that's, if you agree with that idea, but the idea of like, you know, people wanting to compare query to query, say. Yeah, um, yeah, that was really helpful feedback for us. Um, what we heard, especially because the old copy paste didn't preserve that column format. So people did go through the painstaking exercise of uh, moving individual cells to make sure it aligned that way. Um, but really the reason why they were initially even going to Excel was to just be able to understand um, 
the differences in the counts when they add or remove certain terms. So that sort of gave us an idea for how we can possibly create something like that in a, in a future release. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of having to go to Excel, can we just do that within our, our application? I have a quick question, uh, Anna Pamela. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you can see the, you can see the query in both after you run it? Yes. Yeah, so, so, yeah. so you be able to use that export CSV the, in the old? UI? Uh, yeah, so any query that's run here, if you log into the legacy web client, it should show up in your previous query list. So yes, that is a, a, a workaround. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions we'd be happy to take in the Q and A. Um, I think I'll just I'll repeat some of the things that have been frequently asked questions in the past and in Obama, if you can think of any others. Um, actually, I think maybe I'm sort of restating some of the things you said earlier, so apologies for that. But yeah, this, this new web client will sit alongside the existing web client for the time being, at least, so both will be supported. And um, they use, some of, the, they use the same, some of the same infrastructure on the back end. So this is not a completely separate install of Shrine that you need to do um, in addition to ITB2 and current Shrine install. So we're not um, you know, increasing the footprint that's required locally. Uh, significantly. So the other question we got was whether uh, queries are can be run sort of in parallel. And the answer to that is yes, uh, you can launch a query um, and then, you know, immediately, you know, immediately go ahead and launch the next. Uh, that is certainly a capability within the new web client. Yeah, the only thing I will point out, it you will always automatically be navigated to the view results page. So you just mm -hmm. have to click back and then um, run run it again. Yep. Uh, we've got a question in here from uh, Shantha. Would it be possible to select results for only interested organizations instead of for all? Um, Shantha, I'm not sure if I can let me see if I can unmute you or allow you to speak because um, I am not sure if you mean just to execute the query against a subset of organizations or if you mean um, select and cut and paste. Um, so I think I've permitted you to speak, Shantha. Shantha, are you able to unmute? Perhaps not. So I'll, I'll actually, I'll sort of just answer both of the, the possibilities there um, and hopefully I will get at it. Um, it is still not possible even within the new web client um, to select a subset of the network to query against. Um, every query will run against all institutions uh, as it always has been, as it is in the legacy web client. Um, we do provide a little bit more um, sorting of the results in the new web client um, as I think Inupama, oh yeah, Inupama is showing there. Um, and I think as long as you're, um, oh, no problem, Shantha. Um, as long as you are um, selecting sort of, I think, um, am I trying to say like sort of contiguous rows, you will be able to um, cut and paste a subset into another document, uh, but not non-contiguous rows. And if that, if neither of those answered your question, Shantha, please um, just go ahead and, and type in a clarification and I'd be happy to try to hit that up. Thank you, any problem? I feel so powerful. I feel like I'm just saying things and things are happening. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> <laughs> any other, oh, another question. Uh, is there, this is from Alar, is there a possibility to have query timing like criteria occurring in the same encounter or independently? Uh, so I think that if I'm, you know, in a problem, you may need to correct me if I'm wrong. That is, is a feature of the current web client. Uh, sorry, Mark, can you repeat this, uh, the question? I think I might have understood that as temporal-based queries. Well, that's what I, I think that was sort of getting at. It is. 
It is, okay. So that's, that's the funny thing about tempo queries. Is I think we've used that term before and I think a few of us have had a few different um, understandings of what tempo queries have meant. I think we at least got that from one session that we did. Um, so in the, so in a problem, I'll let you answer that. So um, the new UI will not be supporting event-based or temporal queries at this time. Um, when the release, uh, what we are working on is for the next release, the requirements for that uh, piece. So um, like I mentioned, we wanted to make sure this was most powerful and, and valuable to novice users. And so in our research, we, it, uh, it kind of pointed to that this is more of an advanced feature. Um, but because we are supporting both web clients, you can run, you can continue to run those temporal queries. Um, so the functionality is, is still available across the Shrine platform, but not specifically in the new UI. Um, and I'll just add one more piece to that. So with terms of cross compatibility, um, one, you, you can always view the information here, but when you attempt to reload um, criteria with features that aren't supported in the 2020 web client, there is an error mess or a warning message to the user to explain, um, you know, we, we don't currently support all of this feature. So we, we really wanna make sure we're providing the right feedback to the user um, to make sure that they understand, you know, if there's any issues loading uh, the information. But um, temporal constraints for, at the point of this first release of the new web client, will only be supported by the legacy web client. So again, this is where we, where it's really valuable for us to be able to interact with um, some people that are using the client and understand um, how they use the, how they use Shrine, what, how they want to use Shrine, and what we can do to support those in future releases. So um, for folks who do credential end users, I would say, you know, if you can, you know, give folks that link, um, ask, let them know that there's an opportunity to communicate with us about their experience of using the web client or um, how they want to be able to use the web client, we'd be happy to have them on the roster. Um, I, you know, I just want to be clear, I wouldn't give folks that link as a sort of customer service. Um, you know, opportunity, I think if someone has a question or someone is sort of stuck, that won't really get them to a, to a place where we can um, answer their questions. There's gonna be on a roster of folks that we might contact. Um, so they might find it very unsatisfying if they filled out that form thinking they were filling it out to get some sort of support. Um, really, we're asking them to fill out that form just to let us know that they would be willing to have us contact them to, um, to maybe do a session with Anupama one-on-one. -on -one. And talk to them about their query, their query behavior, their desired query behavior, and how they want to use the tool or do use the tool. Um, and I'll also point out these sessions have been really helpful for us. We've conducted about a dozen of them so far. Um, so we're able to really understand not only how they're interacting with this specific application, but also, like I mentioned, their end-to-end -end workflow. How do they get started? How are they getting trained? What other tools are available at their site? Um, and also, what, what, what are the next steps afterwards? How often do they, are, are they done after they get the aggregate patient counts, or do they really need to do those next steps? Um, and there's also features that came out for um, ideas for how we can improve. So part of the feedback that we got was to change some of the color schemes for this bottom panel here um, before it was a little too gray and it seemed like it was inactive. Um, and we also got a few other pieces of feedback in terms of being able to do multi-select here, being able to move concepts within panels, um, being able to enter an age range instead of having to drag over multiple concepts. Um, so we weren't able to address all of them, but we have, you know, appropriately placed them in our backlog to make sure that when the opportunity arises, we will be able to address it. We have one more question from Bo. Um, will this web client be used to replace the I2B2 uh, web client UI in the future? Um, Bo, I'll answer that question as far as I can, and if any of the other panelists want to um, speak to this at all, certainly feel free. Um, no, there is no plan at this point for this um, UI to replace the current I2B2 web client um, at any point in the foreseeable future. 
uh, at least not that I can um, imagine. Um, you know, the ITB2 team has been making um, really important changes to their UI that have been, I think, look fantastic. And so um, it would be unfair, you know, I think we were sort of completing this work um, knowing that there were a lot of improvements from the Shrine web client, which is a fork of the ITB2 web client as it existed quite a while ago. Um, it is not a fork of a very sort of contemporary I2B2 web client. So uh, there have been a lot of improvements made to the I2B2 web client um, in parallel in that same time. Any other questions or comments at this point? I will say it's been, you know, really incredible to see the work of the team. Um, and I think back to this time last year and how I, for folks who were here in Boston uh, for the same session, you may have been surprised that you had, you know, basically a member of the Shrine development team at your table and we were flipping through wireframes on paper and asking folks about some of the most basic first steps um, of, of, you know, of creating a query. So it's really come a long way and it's come a long way with, you know, really a lot of feedback and assistance and great thought from a lot of folks in the, you know, ITB2 Transmart UI working group from the folks that Amy Palm has been able to speak to, you know, you know, one-on-one -on -one fashion. Um, so it really has been, uh, you know, sounds like a cliche, but it really has been a team effort to get as far as we have. And I think we will be looking to develop this even further. This is not the last, um, effort that we will put into the web client, this new web client. So uh, it will continue to get improvements as we go along and we can look forward to this very first version uh, in the next few weeks as part of the Shrine um, 3.0 release that will be coming out. Just want to pause to see if there's, just give folks a moment if there are any other questions or concerns about this. Um, or anything else we can mention at this point about you know, future features or all right so then before we before I hand it back over to Elena um, I will just make out one last plug if you can um, get users or yourself in touch with me if you are a you know, frequent user of temporal queries that would be fantastic. Or if you can pass out that um, Google form link to anyone that might, you think might be useful for us to speak to as we continue to develop this, um, that would be fantastic. And then very lastly, if you are a sysadmin of a node that has a non-production network hooked up, uh, sorry, non-production node hooked up to a non-production um, hub, um, and you are interested in having a pre-release version of this and helping us make sure that it uh, continues to thrive in the real world, um, please do reach out to me. Um, otherwise, I or either Elena or I will be reaching out um, probably in the next week to uh, solicit volunteers to help us out. Anything else, Inupama? Nope, I think you covered everything and thank you for, for uh, emceeing this. No problem. It's my initials, so uh, worst joke ever. I'll hand it over to Elena now. <laughs> that was a great joke, Mark. <laughs> and thank you, Mark. Thank you, Anna Palma. I know we're all so excited to see it and be a part of this process uh, over the past year and beyond. So really pumped to actually have this in production. So as Mark said, be on the lookout for a note either from, uh, from him or from me. And like the rest of the releases coming this summer, starting with the ontology on Monday, stay tuned to the technology distribution list for more detailed information on where to go, timeframes, where to update your status, all of that good stuff. So 